Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service of evening prayer on this, the 2nd of August, as we begin uh, the summer months. Um, just want to say that this will be the last for the next couple of weeks. We, we won't be having evening prayer uh, then. Um, but just want to say thank you to Ivan once again for providing us with an address later on in our service. As we begin, shall we just prepare our hearts? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, praying together with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. And Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him, which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And our psalm for this morning is taken from Psalm 80, verses 1 to 7. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim. Shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, 
Will your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbours, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We now have our first reading, which is taken from the first book of Kings, chapter 10, beginning to read at verse 1 through to verse 13. The Queen of Sheba visits Solomon. When the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the Queen of Sheba gave, gave to King Solomon. Here in ships brought gold from Aphia, and from there they brought great cargoes of Amalgmuk, Al, <laughs> Almugwood and precious stones. The king used the Almugmud to make supports for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. So much Almugmud was never, has never been imported or seen since that day. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. Here ends the first lesson. And so we say together the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. For he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath holpen his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed for ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We now have our second lesson, which is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 1. 
Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They travelled through the whole island until they came to Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Here ends the second lesson. And so we say together the Nunc Dimittis, the song of Simeon. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And we declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, 
and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. And in a moment of quiet we lift to the Lord those on our hearts today. I'm thinking especially of those who are unwell and recovering. Thinking of Audrey and Jackie and Carolyn and John. And those others that we know, entrusting them to God's mercy. And the collect for the ninth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church, open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Though God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. And together we pray. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we come to our two readings this evening, um, I want us to notice the similarities and the differences. Uh, as a similarity, both are coming, both the Queen of Sheba and Sergius Paulus, they, they're both wanting to hear the word of God. They're both coming in search of wisdom and truth. And yet the, the ways they come are very, very different. Uh, we're going to find that as we look at the Queen of Sheba, she comes uh, all the way to see Solomon, to know his wisdom. Whereas in the other case, it's Paul and Barnabas who actually go to Sergius Paulus. It's it, emphasises a shift in, or a change, not in the truth, not in the wisdom that comes from God, but in the way in which that, that truth, that wisdom is given. And I'll try to uh, explain that as we go forward and what it means for us today. And so as Ivan has said, the Queen of Sheba, in the first instance, came to see for herself. If everything she'd heard about Solomon was true, uh, Josephus uh, suggests that she was inquisitive about philosophy and she admired, you know, all these particular things, this wisdom, this understanding and all the sort of things of the palace. Um, and contests of riddles and proverbs were used to test wisdom. And it's most likely that she would have used some of these to question Solomon. So she was coming seeking to understand what made Israel, what made his kingdom so great? Uh, I'm reminded of a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 4, where um, obedience is commanded for the people. And then Moses says to them, Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them, the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? And so the idea is that uh, Israel, under God, as they obeyed his commands, would be a shining light in the world. 
and Solomon, following David, has established this kingdom. This kingdom which is a shining light and people are wanting to know how uh, has this nation arisen? Where have they got this wisdom? How is the Lord blessing them and being near them and answering their prayers? And so the Queen of Sheba goes. She makes that journey to find answers. She came to receive instruction through his wisdom to improve her own. And when she realised the extent of his riches and his wisdom, she was overwhelmed with understanding, with admiration. She no longer questioned him, his power and his wisdom. Uh, John Bright in his book, The History of Israel, suggests that she may have gone as well to establish good trade relations. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Solomon was a, a very wealthy uh, king. And although most of Solomon's trade links were by sea, he was also interested in overland trade from the south. And Sheba is understood to be today's East Yemen. Its caravan trade was dominated by spices and incense. And so Solomon controlled the northern territories of the trade routes and its maritime ventures brought him into direct competition with her trade. And so she was keen to find some sort of uh, combined working, if you like. And she brought samples of her wares, gold and jewels and spices. We're not told what he gave her in return, but the phrase that he gave her all that she asked for draws the conclusion that they reached a satisfactory trade agreement. But clearly she also was interested in his belief in God. And she is so impressed that she and her subjects worshipped the Jewish God. St Luke records that Jesus, when he was warning against unbelief, said the Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Whereas one greater than Solomon in Jesus Christ was now there and they refused to listen. His own people refused how far they had fallen. And so we have this picture of, in a sense, the Queen of Sheba coming with all her retinue to fall at the feet of Solomon and listen to his wisdom, to know his God. Things are very different in the New Testament, for we hear that the New Testament reading describes uh, the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. It's noted that he was still known at this point as Saul. The church was praying at Antioch. Now that's it's a new Gentile establishment, not in Jerusalem. This is occurring in Antioch and the Holy Spirit has instructed them to send Paul, Saul and Barnabas on a mission. And after fasting and praying, the others laid hands on them and dedicated them to their journey. They were being led by the Holy Spirit. They followed the trade routes of the Roman Empire, which made their travel easier. They visited key population and cultural areas to teach as many people as possible. They went to cities which had synagogues to preach the Jews that the Messiah had come. And their first stop was Cyprus, which not only had a large Jewish population, but Barnabas was a native of Cyprus. So he had inside knowledge, he was known, it was natural that he would want to share the good news of Jesus with his own people. And it was a culture, a people that he understood and that understood him. The governor, we read, was Sergius Paulus, who had a sorcerer named Elimus, who realised that if Sergius were to become a Christian, he would be made redundant. So he made every effort to persuade Sergius to ignore Saul's teaching. But Saul, on the other hand, recognised that if Sergius Paulus were to convert to Christianity, his job would be made much easier in the area. He would be given that freedom to preach the gospel. Well, Sergius received Paul's message to become a Christian. And it was about this time that Saul changed his name from the Hebrew Saul to the Roman Paul. And here we see a very subtle shift 
So if we compare these two accounts and think of our church, we have tended in these last perhaps few decades to imagine that people would be so impressed by the church, so impressed by Christianity, so taken with the wisdom of God, that they would come to church to hear the word, just as the Queen of Sheba came to Saul, uh, came to uh, Solomon. But here we find a shift that in the New Testament, that whole image of Israel as being the people of God has been eroded. They are an occupied people. And Christianity has risen like a phoenix uh, from the ashes, if you like. And now in Antioch, Gentile territory, the question is, how are people going to hear the message? Will they come to us to hear the gospel? And the answer is no. We have to go to them. We have to go out with the word of God to them. And we have to be the ones that do the work. And pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us to those hearts that he has prepared. And that's what Saul and Barnabas did. And when they were confronted with opposition, they prayed for the Lord to take that opposition away, to make the way smooth. And so that's what we've got, this change in perspective. And perhaps that's something we need to take into our hearts. It's so easy to remain in our churches and expect the people to come to us. But the New Testament model is that the church goes to the people. Now our passage ends, as I say, with trouble in the camp. We're not given why John Mark left Paul and Barnabas at this time. There's been a, a number of suggestions from commentators, Ivan says, uh, he was very young, he may have become very homesick. Um, John Mark may have resented the change of leadership from his cousin Barnabas to Paul. I think that's unlikely. He became ill. That was a regular feature at the time for people on journeys, but that wouldn't explain Paul's anger. He may have been unable to withstand the rigours of a missionary journey. It may be that he only meant to go that far, but had failed to advise Paul and Barnabas of that. Whatever the reason, Paul was angry, accused him of lacking courage and commitment. Although in later years, he grew to respect and appreciated Mark's support as his life neared its end. And I suppose there is that very real tension between us. We, when we think of how the church has now got to go out to the people, that takes courage. It means we've got to go out of our comfort zone. And it means that we will often be put into situations where we feel lost and we feel unable And Paul perhaps was a little harsh on Mark, we don't know. But Mark really struggled. And I think we can take comfort in that. It is not easy. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need to give ourselves to the Holy Spirit in order to do this. We cannot expect people to come to us. Things are very different. Ivan concludes by saying both the readings show the power of the Holy Spirit at work. It says it reminded me of the time when I was interviewed by the bishop about possible ordination. And he asked if I was worried about anything. And when I replied that it had been some years since I'd done any studying, he thundered, if you are driven by the Holy Spirit, you have nothing to fear. And he was right. I think that's the message for us. If we are driven, if we are compelled, if we are moved by the Holy Spirit, then we will be empowered by him. We will be enabled by him. And we will have nothing to fear. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the courage of Paul and Barnabas and John Mark because of them, we are here today, because they sowed the seeds of the gospel. Lord, give us courage. Anoint us by your Holy Spirit, that we too 
may go forth to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we close with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you and those you love and pray for this day and for evermore. Amen.